There is this major lie going around in the body of Christ that if a prophet prophesies something and it doesn't come to pass, one miss makes them a false prophet. And I'm telling you, in the New Testament, you cannot find this anywhere. Most people are going to quote out of the Deuteronomy passage that talks about if a prophet missed a prophetic word, they should be stoned. But people don't read it in its context, okay? In its context, what it's saying is, is that if a prophet intentionally, if there is a motive in their heart that is trying to lead people astray through false prophecy, that's what makes them a false prophet. Touch on it. I had had a series of dreams at the end of 2020, I had seen um, the Dodgers win the World Series, Amy Coney Barrett be set in place as a Supreme Court justice before the election. And then the third thing that I saw was Donald Trump being elected president. And so I had happened to, this was picked up on Charisma Magazine uh, at the beginning of October. And so, you know, the Dodgers win the World Series. So the first thing came to pass, Amy Coney Barrett was set in place. The second thing comes to pass. And then, you know, the weekend before the election, we're in Washington, D.C., Mario Murillo, Lance Wall, now Mario Bramick, just some great guys that love the Lord. And just, you know, rallying the nation, sensing what the Lord was doing. And then, you know, fast forward to election day and just, just the whole swirl, everything that happened. So I had a, a personal decision that I felt like the Lord was stirring me about. It wasn't, re it wasn't about whether I was right or wrong. I had this keen awareness that he was going to use me as a sign specifically to the prophetic movement. And so we went through this season of me offering a, a letter of apology to the body of Christ for what I believe was a miss. But the Lord began this um, incredible work in my heart. Uh, it was full of crushing. It was full of um, just searching of my heart. A lot of the folks that had supported us for over a decade sort of turned on us. You know, they leaked our address online, death threats. We lost half of our support base. We lost about $40,000 of financial monthly support in less than a week. And so we just went through a really rough season. But in the midst of that, God began to refine me. He began to help me find a, a clear focus again on what he'd called me to. So out of that came what I believe him saying, a man in a ministry has to die for an end time movement to be birthed in the earth, which we've called the altar global. And so I'm really focused on the forerunner ministry that the Lord has given me. I was not aware that I was under the power of witchcraft so severe. I was invited in July of 2021 to a meeting at Bishop Joseph Garlington's church. Uh, Bill Hammond had invited me to come and just share about my journey. A lot of people had seen me all throughout 2020 and then seen the letter and just trying to figure out what was happening. And I got up to share just shared what my family had gone through. And I tried to get down off the stage and was confronted by a couple of prophets there who said, what the body of Christ has done to you is wrong. And we're here to break the power of witchcraft off of you. Not a minister of the Lord. How Shame on you. you apologize Donald for God. Trump I know God's plan is for Trump. Jerk. You are a wolf in sheep's clothing. You're a coward. A You're a traitor. Disgusting. And I'm praying for your soul. My life has been threatened. My world has been turned upside down. News agencies from around the world have asked for interviews. Donald Trump and the prophetic controversy. I was wrong. Well, today's episode is going to hit home a little bit more than normal uh, for a couple of reasons because of my affiliation with the prophetic movement in the past and identifying myself as a false prophet in the new apostolic reformation and also running in the same circles with the individual we're going to be talking about today i want to talk about some of the things that jeremiah points to in the past few years regarding the trump prophecies and the election this is not going to be a political podcast so just take a deep breath and go with me on this journey today but i want to talk about biblical repentance and i think this will be a really good example to look at and i'm going to let you be the judge based on what scripture says and based on the the fruit that we're seeing is this biblical repentance or is there a rebranding going on so i think it's a it's a conversation worth having let's dive in Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. We have a lot of ground to cover today, and there's going to be a lot of clips, and I have found a couple of clips from another video that I think you're going to find extremely helpful that's going to answer some things and provide a uh, theological rebuttal to some of the arguments that Jeremiah Johnson presents, which you heard some of the clips in the beginning. I selected a few of those to play, 
And I have a lot more to play today because I'm going to go through some things that you may be aware of and may not be aware of as far as what transpired with Jeremiah and where he is currently and some things that I found that as, as I was looking and digging when I'm always talking about things like topics that are coming out of the NAR and why there are concerns with this. And I'll be honest with you. I had some frustrations when listening to this. Uh, I had some frustrations because of the things that I was finding that seemed like discrepancies in the claims that were being made. I found frustration when I was hearing uh, discrepancies in uh, some of the dreams versus what happened. And I'm going to show you some of these things. And what I would encourage you to do today as you're listening to this and you're considering what's being said versus what scripture says and um, some of the things that were claimed. I want you to be a good Berean. As always, I don't want you to go by what I'm saying and to believe what I'm telling you. I want you to look at this evidence that I'm presenting to you today, and I want you to evaluate it, to test it in accordance with Scripture and the fruit, and come to a conclusion that's biblical and what we need to be doing um, as far as calling people to repentance, true repentance, biblical repentance, and acknowledging why we don't need modern day prophets today and why there are indeed false prophets and why fallible prophecy and the change definition that's come about within the past 100 years in the prophetic movement, why that matters. Because it's a serious matter when you begin to say that God told you something and he didn't. And then we want to say it's like calling balls and strikes or oh, I just missed it, or I apologize, or I repent and apologize to the body of Christ. And I don't want to diminish someone apologizing for something, but at the same time, I think we need to consider what is true biblical repentance, what it is not, uh, what the definition of a false prophet is, and what it is not, and to look at this particular example. So with that, we're going to look at Jeremiah Johnson's journey and I'm going to be pulling from quite a few clips. I've watched a lot of videos, <laughs> done a lot of research, and I'm presenting everything to the best of my ability from what I can find because some of the things are deleted. I can't access some of the things that were online, such as Facebook Lives and things that were on his um, personal Facebook page because that was indeed deleted. But we're going to address some of the, the statements or the claims that he made with, with some things and this is this is very uncomfortable for me to do this it's very unpleasant this is not a personal issue this is a public matter because this was made to be that this was public repentance and because it was a public prophecy and i want to give credit of saying though i appreciate someone like jeremiah being willing to come out and say the things that he did and say i was wrong uh, at the same time there are some issues with the things that are being taught and so I, I come at this with um, great soberness, but also with, um, with sadness and compassion, um, frustration, and wanting God to truly be glorified and honored in his word. So when we look at what Jeremiah did, uh, we're actually going to start after the first election. So he had claimed that he had heard early on um, that, that Trump was going to be president. Again, this is not a political episode, so I, I'm not even going to engage anything as far as where you lie on, on the side of, of political matters. That's a whole other topic for another day, a whole other can of worms. This is a big enough can of worms as it is. But he begins with talking about when he, when he relays his prophetic journey and his process of this, and where it came to up to 2020 with him, him falsely prophesying, and that's exactly what he did. He falsely prophesied along with many other people that claimed to be prophets. And this is where it's frustrating for me and it's sad for me because as someone who was in this movement um, and identified as a prophet in this movement and then was brought to great contrition and brokenness before God because of my sin and my egregious sin, my egregious sin and error against God in blaspheming his name and taking his name in vain. Um, I was brought to great repentance because of that. And I'm thankful because of God's mercy that I did not deserve that he granted me repentance. And by his grace, 
and, and his spirit and his word working in my life, I have turned from those ways and have acknowledged the truth of God's word and continuing to do that and continuing to be sanctified um, and by, by his grace alone. And so I give him all the glory for that, but we'll get back to this. So Jeremiah, uh, when he's processing all of this, and he did this through a series, which we'll get to very soon called I Was Wrong, he talks about his, his journey through that. And so um, he, he claims that he did correctly and accurately prophesy that Trump would be president in 2016, and then we go on from there. So let's take a little bit to listen to three different clips. The first one that you're going to hear before we launch into all of this discussion about looking at the false prophecy is you're going to hear uh, Jeremiah Johnson talk on Sid Roth for one and about the a prophetic word about Kanye West and how he's going to help Donald Trump get the uh, African-American votes that he needs in order to win. The second clip you're going to hear is from a, a, a show that is called Encounter Today that Alan Didio uh, oversees and he had Jeremiah on that show and you're going to hear a few times through this episode about the baby boomers and that he has this dream or vision uh, about uh, the Boston Marathon and that Trump is trying to run in there and he collapses and two older women come alongside him and carry him over the finish line. And Jeremiah believed that the baby boomers were going to be pivotal in helping Trump get reelected, that the destiny of the United States was within the baby boomers and, and what would happen to the United States. And then the last clip is actually going to be from the Strang Report. Now, this is off Charisma News uh, site. Uh, dated November 2nd, 2020. I'm setting these up for you so you can hear them and you can hear what's going on. And there's a discrepancy in the last one that I want to talk about today along with this. And I hope that you'll bear with me because there's a lot of material here. But like I said, I think this is a, a conversation worth having and worth looking at so we can understand what true biblical repentance is. Uh, was there any rebranding that was going on? And um and, re and really consider uh, the ramifications of believing infallible prophecy today when that's not found in scripture. And it is this out of the box revival. So I went online and I prophesied, God is gonna raise up Kanye West as a wrecking ball. It was just months later when literally in the news, Kanye West comes out with this album, this conversion. And here's what the Lord said to me. I really want our listeners tonight to, to, to tune in here. God said, I have given Kanye West as a gift to Donald Trump because he is going to win him votes in the African-American community that he needs to win the 2020 election. So I believe Kanye West is a secret agent in the hands of the Lord in, in, in the harvest field. answer this question is this. I had a dream in the book that Donald Trump was running the Boston Marathon and there was crowds that were that were all around him and about 100 yards from the finish line, he fell down and couldn't get back up. And the crowds, you know, Boston is oftentimes very liberal. They were going crazy. And two older women hmm. came somehow. One was on a cane, one was on a walker and they made their way through the crowd, two older women. They helped Donald Trump get to his feet and he made it to the finish line. I do believe that Donald Trump will be reelected. However, I don't believe he's going to get there without the help of the prayers of the saints. And in particularly, God spoke to me that the future of America is in the hands of the baby boomers. Yeah. I believe that there is a demographic of people born from 1946 to 1964. I believe that they actually have an anointing. They're the true patriots of this nation. They know what's at stake. I believe if they don't get involved and they don't pray, I believe we could very well see Biden be elected. But I just have a sense from the dream that they helped Donald Trump. I just don't believe Trump rose to, to, to for one election for, for four years. I believe his main assignment will actually fall in the latter four years. So I've done everything in my power to rally baby boomers. I think is being perpetuated. So I think the future of America belongs to the baby boomers. I do believe Donald Trump will be reelected. And I do believe that when he is reelected, we're going to continue to see civil unrest. I do believe that there's going to be an increase of rioting and looting. But I just simply believe that Trump is waiting to be reelected for him to deal decisively and swiftly with some of the madness we're seeing on the streets. And you recently had an encounter with the Lord and you were telling me about it. It had to do with the Dodgers and Amy Coney Barrett. And what in the world's going on? Yeah, thanks so much, Steve, for having me on. I had had a prophetic dream several weeks ago that I walked up to Lou Engel and handed him two tickets to the World Series where the Los Angeles Dodgers were playing. And I had said to Lou in the dream that there was a message that God had for him. And so when I woke up from the dream, I looked up where the World Series was being played. And it was being played in Texas, which I found significant because that's where Roe v. Wade 
uh, was passed into uh, into law. And then it was being the games were being played at Globe Life Stadium, which I felt was significant. And so when I woke up, I decided to reach out to Lou and share this dream with him. And while I was talking with him, I began to prophesy to him uh, even before the World Series. I, I said to Lou that I, I believe the Lord said to me that the Dodgers would win the World Series, and this would be a sign that God is not done with Los Angeles or California. And I told him that Amy Coney Barrett would be set in as a Supreme Court justice before the election and that Donald Trump would be reelected. And I said to Lou on the phone that if all three of these events happen, if the Dodgers won the World Series, which they, they did win, if Amy Coney Barrett was set in place before the elections, which she has been. Now, the final one, Donald J. Trump being reelected is yet to happen. I believe it will. I told Lou that if all three of these things happened, it would be a sign to him that he was to call one million women to the mall on Washington, in Washington, D.C., to see Roe v. Wade overturned in America. And so I believe that Amy Coney Barrett is a modern-day Esther, and God has called Lou Engel like a Mordecai. And I believe that Amy Coney Barrett has opened up what I'm calling a new Esther and Deborah era in the body of Christ, where we're going to see a massive righteous women's movement. I believe the Lord revealed to me that the Roe v. Wade, it really is a women's issue. And God is going to call forth women from all over America to gather at the mall one day to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Well, this is a pretty incredible word, Jeremiah. And of course, time will tell if Donald Trump wins. And I'm interested that you say he will win. And I have interviewed a number of people uh, recently, going all the way back to when I wrote my book, God Trump at the 2020 election, that Donald Trump would be in, in for two terms. But oh boy, if you watch the polls or watch the news, it, it sounds like Biden has it in the bag. Uh, however, uh, Sid Roth told me last week and several others that he's going to win. So apparently you feel that the Lord has shown you the same thing. Yes. You know, I, I want to emphasize the lying part, but I believe that the, the lying media has become the modern day false prophets of Baal. And so I, I believe that even regarding the polls, uh, we saw this with different things with the coronavirus, with the statistics not matching. I just believe that the lying media is at work. I believe that they are the modern day false prophets of Baal. Now, that last clip that you heard from the Strang report, I want to make a note of something because we're going to notice a discrepancy as we go on and we hear Jeremiah uh, in a clip that he talks about he was wrong. He had a series that he started in February of 2021 titled I Was Wrong, and he had this on YouTube. There were three parts to this, and I took notes, so we're going to summarize all those because I watched them, and I'm going to play some clips for you, and then interspersed in that, when we get to that, I have a couple of clips from um, a, a theologian that is very knowledgeable about this and the charismatic movement and the history of it that I feel like that this will be very helpful to you. But I want you to notice in the Strang Report in this particular uh, broadcast, because there's two of them we're going to hear, but in this one, this particular one, St uh, Steve Strang is interviewing Jeremiah Johnson, and he is talking about these, this dream that he had, this one dream. And it's about the Los Angeles Dodgers and the phone call with Lou Engel and what transpired in a prophetic word. He said he gave to Engel about Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court and Trump being reelected like a trifecta, if you will. And when all those things happened, there would be a one million woman uh, march at the mall in Washington, D.C. to end Roe versus Wade. I'm going to talk about that one million march here very soon in the near future because there's more to that. And it's actually coming to a culmination. And that was not something new that that was talked about in um, in 2020. So I, I've done a little bit of digging on that, but that that's for another day. Just keep this in the back of your mind until we get to this. It was one dream, the Los Angeles Dodgers winning the World Series, okay? Just keep it right there. Now, I want you to listen to some clips that were taken from shortly after, I believe a week or so after, give or take, um, from Jeremiah ministering somewhere and what was said about all the prophets in general and what their response was to the election and I want you to also notice the example I'll use of the clip. Again, the baby boomer thing comes up, the Boston Marathon. He has a, a, a real life example of this going on and that, you know, you have to pray, uh, partner with, if you will. This is something very common in this movement is that people are told if they don't partner with the prophetic word, then it will not come to pass. Forget that he is omnipotent, that he is sovereign over all things. Forget that. If you don't pray and you don't do do certain things, then God is unable to, to work and to do things. Have a listen to these two clips. 
obviously seen on television now that President-elect Joe Biden has now declared himself the winner by the media. <clears throat> As someone who is in touch with all the prophets in America who have prophesied that Donald Trump would win a second term, they're not giving an inch. They're not willing to budge. They're not willing to repent. All of us are unanimous believing the word that God spoke to us that Trump indeed would win a re-election. And that what's happening right now is the false prophets of the media are literally cutting themselves, they're dancing in the street, and they're shouting. Meanwhile, there are much larger issues on our hands than just a presidency. I've told people this, listen, if he doesn't end up getting reelected, I will openly repent to the body of Christ. I don't believe just because you miss a prophecy makes you a false prophet. You definitely missed it, but in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. And we don't prophets supernatural. And he asked me who would win the 2020 election. And I told him a story, and the story was this. I had a dream in 2019. I asked the Lord who would win the 2020 election. And in the dream, Donald Trump was running the Boston Marathon. And there were crowds that were all around him. They were spitting on him. They were laughing at him. They were mocking him. And he fell down about 100 yards from the finish line, and he could not get up. I believe we're in that period of time right now in America. And supernaturally, two older women pushed their way through the crowd and helped him get up and helped him get to the finish line. Now, these are some ladies up on the screen who read this dream. They flew to Boston, and they literally took the Appeal to Heaven flag through the Boston Marathon finish line. How many of you know prophecy takes partnership? Right? You have to partner with the word of the Lord. I mean, you can blame the prophets for missing it, of course, but what about where was the participation in the body of Christ? Of course, you not only have, you know, people that don't want to vote because they don't see Jesus Christ on the ticket, but you have people don't vote because they just don't like Trump. But these individuals, and in the dream and what I shared this year, the Lord said to me, these older women, they represent prayer and intercession. So, uh, li listening to that from November of 2020, it sure sounds like at the time that all the prophets, including Jeremiah, had united to say, we're not backing off of this. Um, we're, we're not going to repent. We're not going to apologize. Now, that tune changed a few months later in January of 2021 of, of saying something publicly. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, but you, you hear him say this. And also, the second thing was essentially blaming the people in a way and saying, you know, you have to partner with the word. You have to partner with the, the prophetic word that the prophets release. So from November, early November until January, around the time of January 6th, again, we're not going to talk about that today, uh, a third can of worms, but January 7th is where we start to see that there is a change. And so in January of 2021, Jeremiah put out a public statement and he talks about this in his series, I Was Wrong, again, as we'll talk about and go through in, in summarized detail. But um, I'll, I'll share the screenshots with you for that when, when we get there. But um, he talks about that and his public apology. And then there were multiple news articles that came out both from, um, from both parts of, of beliefs, liberal and conservative, that addressed him saying that he was apologizing and for, for missing it. Um, he said he apologized and that he repented to the body of Christ for what he did, if it disillusioned anybody uh, in, their, in the prophecy, and his expectations were completely opposite of what he thought was going to happen in the midst of all that. So with that, we are going to look at this three-part series that he did titled, I Was Wrong. This came out in February of 2021. And um, I know I'm going a little bit forward and then going to go backwards, but I think this is the best way to tackle this, to try to keep it streamlined. So let's jump ahead a month into 2021. We're going to do some time travel, if you will. <laughs> Just kidding. We're going to look at I Was Wrong, this series that Jeremiah Johnson produced in February of 2021, and we're going to begin with part one. In the beginning of part one, Jeremiah begins with going back to his accurate prophecy from 2015. And just as an observation, um, I believe that maybe that was uh, considered a good place to start because that reminds people of his um, presumed accuracy in prophesying. Now, I have some thoughts about that as someone who was in this and now coming out of it and 
doing more biblical study on it and listening to um, Bible scholars on this that have done a lot of studying on this and and take the word of God very seriously and want to uphold and revere the word of God and wanting to listen to, I've heard both sides now. I've heard the one side for years, almost two decades, and now I'm listening to another this other side. I'm also listening to those that are not part of the NAR that are continuationists and wanting to hear and be fair on both sides with that. And also taking into consideration the, the history of the charismatic movement and the holes that were left in what I personally was taught and maybe you were as well. Anyway, Jeremiah begins with 2015, uh, with him hearing the voice of God in the sanctuary, going into the bathroom, writing down the prophetic word about Trump being a trumpet. He was going to be like a, a bull coming in and um, do all these great things. He then jumps to 2018 after the election of 2016 and, and, and talking about and making it clear several times that he was accurate, he goes on to 2018. He talks about a series of dreams that he had regarding Trump, and these were more dreams of a warning type status. The trouble in that is that there would be um, uh, difficulties in his run for a second term. And according to Jeremiah, these dreams were not well received by the body of Christ. Donald Trump is in great danger of becoming like Nebuchadnezzar in the years ahead. He will have great success, but the church must pray. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, if Donald Trump humbles himself, I will prolong his prosperity. I remember during this season in 2018 of releasing these two dreams about the Iron Fist and about Nebuchadnezzar. I want to go on record as saying these dreams were not received by the body of Christ at all. I was well received in 2015 when God had used me in the nation, in the nations, prophesying the destiny of Donald Trump. But when these two dreams came of warning, when God began to ask me to sound the alarm concerning potential character flaws with Donald Trump, I remember in that season being met time and time again with the anger and the frustration of the body of Christ. It was during this part one that Jeremiah also talks about this professor coming to visit him who was collecting prophecies about Donald Trump. And he informed Jeremiah that of all the prophets that were giving words about Donald Trump, he was the only one giving a negative report or a negative word, a negative prophecy. In early 2019, he had another dream involving alligators and Donald Trump. And near the end of 2019 is where he has this dream where he continues several times, as we will hear today, he refers to the Boston Marathon of Donald Trump running it and having difficulty getting over the finish line without the baby boomers. And I want to point back to the couple of clips I've already played one from shortly after the election in November of 2020 when he spoke to a, a congregation and also on Alan Didio's show Encounter Today where he talked about this dream. He's talked about it on more than one occasion, pointing to that even in some interviews that he's done that I can find as early as uh, 2022. And I'm sure he may continue to talk about that because sometimes that happens in this movement that will cling to certain things and talk about them. And let me just make another observation. Uh, there's a lot of dependency just listening to Jeremiah um, and, and others, but in this situation with this episode, there's a lot of referral back to my dreams, my visions, uh, the things God told me, very little scripture. Scripture is mentioned, to be fair, but I, I, as you're going to hear, there is a different interpretation uh, for passages such as Deuteronomy 18 and 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Corinthians 14, 29 that Jeremiah has. And a lot of that has to uh, do with his understanding and his belief of fallible prophecy today. And that just because you prophesy uh, falsely doesn't make you a false prophet. And scripture would disagree with, with him and many others on that. And um, I, I was taught that. So I can understand that type of belief system, but it's not lining up with scripture. And so we have to be willing to go back and look at that. And that's why I believe I was a false prophet in this movement, because uh, one false prophecy is one too many for a prophet of God. Uh, the word does not allow for true prophets of God to have false prophecy, as we're going to find out today in listening to some good, solid teaching on this. So when Jeremiah is talking about the baby boomers, he believes that Trump is not going to make it to 2020 without this generation of baby boomers. Then this particular generation is needed in praying and interceding in order for the, the destiny of this nation to come to fruition. I would just like to remind you again, what does scripture say about God being sovereign? And does this create a God that um, his hands are tied without us doing something? Just some questions to think about.
So now we come to 2020, and we're going to hear a clip now of Jeremiah talking about this and what happened because he says that in 2020, near most of it, he didn't hear anything up until about October of 2020. Let's listen to what he says about what happened. 2020 about whether he would win re-election in November, but all of a sudden at the end of October, I had a dream about the Dodgers, about Amy Coney Barrett, and about Donald Trump winning re-election. And I began to prophesy to the nation, I prophesied to Charisma Magazine that Donald Trump would win re-election. I warned the nation of what might happen if Joe Biden became the 46th president of the United States. Well, the election came. I remember that night watching as Donald Trump was in the lead and slowly throughout the night, his lead began to grow smaller and smaller until the weeks ahead, Joe Biden was declared the winner of the U.S. election. Let's listen to what he said about what happened and what he's claiming he encountered or experienced in October of 2020. Going into 2020, I really had no predictive word about whether Donald Trump would win the 2020 election. People would ask me, I would tell them the dreams like I told you now, he's got a destiny, but there's some serious concerns that I have. And it wasn't until October of 2020, literally one month before the 2020 elections that I had another series of dreams. And in this dream, I saw three visions. And this was October the 20th. The first vision that I saw was the Los Angeles Dodgers winning the World Series. The second vision in the dream that I had was Amy Coney Barrett being set in as a judge uh, on the court before the election day. And then the third part of the dream was Donald Trump being reelected. Again, this is October 20th. Everything that I'm telling you has been documented online. Well, on October 25th and 26th, the Los Angeles Dodgers won the World Series, just like I'd seen in my dream. And on the 26th, Amy Coney Barrett was set in as a Supreme Court judge in place of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. At this point, I interpreted this dream that I had on the 20th, that if two out of the three events happened, I began to publicly prophesy for the very first time that Donald Trump would win re-election. Now, again, I want to remind those watching, I prophesied in 2015 that he'd win the 2016 election. I've shared all these warning dreams, these concerns that God gave me about Donald Trump. I was silent in 2020 about whether he would win re-election in November. But all of a sudden, at the end of October, I had a dream about the Dodgers, about Amy Coney Barrett, and about Donald Trump winning re-election. Oh. Okay, so I I hope you caught that because he said he had three consecutive dreams in October of 2020. And he said that the first one had to do with the Los Angeles Dodgers, a World Series, winning the World Series, and uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and then Trump being reelected. So that's not what he told Steve Strang, and that's not what Charisma put in print. Um, I'll just remind you again, I'm, I'm showing you the articles right here. And if you want, you can go back and listen to what Steve Strang and Jeremiah Johnson said to one another on November 2nd of 2020. But yeah, so he said it was one dream. And then he began to prophesy to Lou Engle on a phone call that he was conscious for and was awake. So that's a big discrepancy. And somebody may think that that maybe holds to this belief. Well, you're splitting hairs. But no, 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 not because he said three dreams, three visions. And he's saying that now in the I was wrong. And he's looking like he was wrong about that. So it's not consistent. And that should be that should be of concern if if there's not consistency in that and i believe there are other inconsistencies that i'm going to show you that are frustrating and um disheartening to say the least so i want to be careful with what words i use because i don't want to accuse someone but i'm just going to again present the material to you and then you can use proper biblical discernment and and judge it for yourself um, if the things that transpired or what transpired and is this, is it okay just to say, oh, I just missed it. You know, I've been, I've been in ministry for years and my track record of, um, as you'll hear him say, uh, his track record of, of accurate prophecy for decades, like 15 years, I think he said, and thousands of prophecies, personal and national. And this is the first one that he's ever had that's, that's incorrect and that he just missed it but apologizing slash repenting and um then going from there and we'll talk talk about what he believes that that god used that in order for him to be 
his ministry to be killed and die so that a new a new ministry could be birthed um yeah so anyway um using the the false prophecy in that way um and and it really it really points to to a man being elevated or exalted and we'll talk about sincerity actually someone else will be talking about sincerity um just because someone's sincere and and you know i can relate to that um sincerity does not mean truth sincerity is not the standard for you um hearing from god and your heart on the matter and uh, wanting to have good intentions um <laughs> You know, I, I think we can easily say that there are people in other false religions and things that they have good intentions, but sincerity is not the barometer or the standard that we go by of which to say, oh, that's truth. And just because you missed it, you were sincere. We don't see that as a standard for prophets in Scripture. And uh, I, I, frankly, I think that that really is um, irreverent to say that. Uh, when you look at the word of God and how serious it is to speak on behalf of God and to and to use his name and stamp it on something when uh, he didn't say it. And even if something did come to pass, such as we see in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5, I, I think we're going to note there too that if that person is leading someone after another God or gods, um, then they are disobeying the very word of God itself. And um, I... I I just want to throw this out and give this as something to consider. Um, just because someone is accurate, uh, which I find very ironic that, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I find it very uh, ironic that there's such a focus on when some, when some of these, like Chris Vallotton and Jeremiah and others, that very few that said, you know, I, I was wrong in my uh, in my prophecy. Okay, great. I'm glad you said that. But then they'll say, but that doesn't make me a false prophet. Well, actually does because that's, <laughs> I'm shouting. I'm sorry. I'm shouting. <laughs> I got to bring, I got, I had to remind myself, got to bring it down a little bit, Dawn. It's okay. So I appreciate the fact that someone wants to say I was wrong, but then they, they want to change the definition of being a prophet of God. Uh, that's not okay. And, and that's according to what scripture says, not according to what Dawn says. But I just find it very ironic that when something like this happens, that the go-to is, well, I've been, I've been accurate for decades. I've been accurate for years. Well, if you believe that there's fallible prophecy, then who cares about your accuracy? Because you believe that there can be fallible prophecy. You believe and you, and you want to say, well, it's, it's not God that's doing it. And I would agree with that because God is not a God of, he's not a, a man that he should lie. Scripture tells us that. And he's not going to say something that's going to contradict his word and is going to make him a liar. At the same time, they will take that and they'll say, but just because I falsely prophesy doesn't make me a false prophet. I just missed it. But I have decades of experience and thousands of prophecies that I've given that were accurate. Well, what does that matter if you believe that there's fallible prophecy? Do you see what I'm saying? It's very double-minded. Why do you care about that if if you believe that there can be error and an error is allowed? Anyway, we'll get back on track. <laughs> I apologize. I told you it was very it's very hard. I'm just going to be transparent with you. Sometimes it's very difficult for me to listen to these things, but I want to utilize um, what the Lord has brought me out of to help you ladies to understand that this is serious. This is a serious matter when someone claims to speak for God and then they say, oh, well, I missed it or I fell to this peer pressure or, or this is why it had, and, but they wanna say, but I'm seasoned. Okay, so now we come to January 7th and this is where he makes his public apology, which you can find on Charisma under their article. I'll show you the screenshots right here and I'm actually gonna read some of this to you. This was dated on January 7th of 2021 and it's titled Jeremiah Johnson, My Public Apology and Process. As he goes through here, he says, my aim in this public apology is twofold. First, I would like to repent for inaccurately prophesying that Donald Trump would win a second term as the president of the United States. I refuse to blame the saints and say it didn't come to pass because they did not pray enough, nor will I proclaim Donald Trump actually won, so I was right, but now it has been stolen from him. 
I believe the first statement seeks to alleviate the prophetic messenger from the responsibility of what he prophesied. And the second statement is filled with potential pride and an unwillingness to humble himself and admit he was wrong. I want to go on record. I was wrong. I am deeply sorry. And I ask for your forgiveness. I specifically want to apologize to any believer in whom I have now caused potential doubt concerning the voice of God and his ability to speak to his people. As a human being, I miss what God was saying. However, rest assured, God himself is not a liar and his written word should always be the foundation and source of our lives as Christians. I would agree with that last statement. Uh, at the same time in this movement, I don't see that as, it, they will say sola scriptura, some of them will, but that's not sola scriptura. Second, I would like to explain my prophetic process along the way so that anyone desiring to grow and learn from my mistakes might have the benefit of doing so, especially other prophets and prophetic people. As a public figure, I recognize my mistakes often have public consequences and I want to be as transparent as possible. And then he goes on to uh, elaborate on that as we are hearing in the I was wrong. Now, I just want to remind you once again of the clip we played earlier. Granted, there was a few months that, that passed, so maybe he had a change of heart on that. But he stood on a platform in November shortly after the election and said, oh, they're all unanimous, that they're not going to to come off of it, we're not backing down, we're not repenting, and you need to partner. In other words, blame the people <laughs> for not partnering with the prophetic word. And the tune changed a couple months later. Again, maybe he had a change of heart, maybe he realized that was an error, I don't know. But there's discrepancies there. And and I would also point you to the fact that and uh, um, what he said to Steve Strang about who the real false prophets were that the false prophets were the news media outlets. Now, that's a fourth can of worms that we could get into. And I and I will share my own opinion on that of, you know, yes, that is frustrating when you see news media outlets that are saying one thing and, and it's not matching up with reality. That's fair. Um, but it's a diversion to um, this was, and granted he said that before the results came out, but it's still, uh, it seems like a diversion. Oh, the false prophets are the news media outlet. It's the people who are the liberals and those who oppose. They're they're um, opposing um, the move of God in in what they're doing because they oppose God Himself. Um, they're painted out to be the false prophets, not those of us that falsely prophesied. Mm -hmm. In this video, Jeremiah says that God told him this. Quote, I want you to admit that you missed it. I want you to tell the body of Christ that you're sorry. So, okay, first of all, think about this. Does this sound like something that God has said in his word? That I want you to admit that you missed it. That's sin, right? Missed the mark? It's sin. Um, is it false prophecy? Does it seem like a little bit of a downplaying to it, diminishing of, of what really was going on? And, and maybe I missed this somewhere, but I've yet to hear the, again, the contrition and the brokenness of repentance to God for saying something he did not say. That's, that's what we have to come to in repentance is acknowledging our sin against a holy God. Um, so I would, I would draw your attention to that, but he's saying that God told him this, that you need to, you need to admit that you missed it. And he expected some to call him a false prophet, but what he was met with, according to him, was a lot of vitriol, hostility. People were very angry. Uh, it was very polarizing, um, to say the least that he said he received death threats, that he had, a, uh, lost a lot of partners, uh, as you heard. Um, during this time, as he came out and admitted that what he did was an error, and uh, he expected to be a call to false prophet, but instead he was met with um, much more hostility and that he lost financially. I, I kind of had to sit back for a moment and think when you hear him talking to Joni Lamb and he says that within a very short period of time that he lost $40,000 a month that they received from the, for the ministry. A lot of the folks that had supported us for over a decade sort of turned on us. You know, they leaked our address online, death threats. We lost half of our support base. We lost about $40,000 of financial monthly support in less than a week. 
Wow. Um, so in addition to that letter, he wrote another one on January 20th, um, continuing to address this. And he said that there was still very much anger and hostility and vitriol that was coming back at him. He's alleging that there were Christians that were sending him death threats. I don't know. Those things, to my knowledge, were not made public. That's not okay. It doesn't matter what you, what is going on. That That's not okay to have that kind of conduct. Uh, we need to call people to repentance as Christians, but we are not to act like the world, and we're not to conduct ourselves in such a way that it would bring reproach on the name of Christ. We want to handle things in a, in a biblical manner. Um, so I don't condone that behavior if that was going on. Calling someone to repentance, if, if that went on, that's biblical because it's false prophecy. I can't stress that enough. It's false prophecy. Again, you're not going to see an example in Scripture of um, a prophet that missed it and that there wasn't repercussions because of that. Um, even in, in the New Testament, there's no standard change between the Old Testament and New Testament, regardless of what Jeremiah is going to say about that. Um, here shortly. And so with this, he believed that um, instead of just placing the focus on his own personal actions, he believes that this is exposing serious issues within the charismatic movement and that God is exposing this and he wants people to look inwardly and to be humble um, and exposing the idolatry that's going on. And he'll talk about this in part two and part three. I'm going to try to summarize these a little bit more for time's sake. But at any rate, he's going to mention that, that really, um, a, even though people aren't at fault, which um, I'll just be frank. I mean, there's, there's accountability on both sides. There's accountability and responsibility on both sides. So I will agree with that to a certain point, but he's not going to take all the a full accountability for his false prophecy because he doesn't believe that he's a false prophet because of that. At the same time, he's going to say, well, it's because there's reformation needed in the charismatic prophetic movement. There, It's sick. What's going on? There's a sickness going on with it. There's idolatry. I would agree. I would agree. There's idolatry going on. And it's a hard pill to swallow when you have people that are um, made to be biblically illiterate in this movement. You have people that are relying on the words of the prophets because they've been told repeatedly second chronicles 2020 believe in the prophets and you will prosper don't question them you have steve strang and others that are saying don't doubt the prophets sid roth i believe the prophets i believe the word of god i believe the prophets they're putting these words on par with scripture and then you want to turn around and say Oh, but, but we believe that prophecy can be fallible today because um, of a congregational prophets. And Jeremiah was not acting as a congregational prophet. Let me just remind you of that. He was acting as a prophet to this nation and speaking on behalf and saying, Trump will win, just like the many others. Do we need modern day prophets today? Or do we have the more sure word of prophecy? And do we have the final prophet who came in the flesh? as truly God and truly man. And his word testifies of him. His word testifies of his gospel and that he has the final word and he is the final word and that's Jesus Christ. We don't need modern day prophets today. We have the word of God. Sorry, I'm going to bring it down. I'm going to bring it down. <laughs> I'm having one of those moments today. I'm just going to have to bring it down. And we'll bring it down. Okay. So why he missed it. He goes into four different reasons why he missed it. Number one, what God spoke privately to him, he should not have spoken publicly. Okay, so if you have a track record, again, once again, I'm sorry for beating a dead horse. If you have a track record of being accurate um, for many years and claiming that this is the first time that you have had an inaccurate prophecy, um, would you not know when to speak for God? I mean, if you're going to to testify and say, I have this track record, I'm seasoned, I'm mature for years, for 15 years or 20 years for some people or 30 years, I've spoken for God, I've not missed it, I've not erred. You're not seasoned enough to know at this point that you shouldn't have spoken that. I don't want to be rude about that, but at the same time, um, it... it it's contradicting what they're trying to prop up as being valid. 
And it's nullifying that. It nullifies that. And it makes no sense. He says he got caught up in the moment and what was happening. So he caved to the peer pressure or I don't know if maybe he he was um, enjoying the the spotlight with this again. Maybe um, in his mind, he, I don't know, maybe he thought, well, I was right the first time. I've got to be right the second time. Who knows? I mean, I don't, you don't know what a person's, uh, what's in a person's heart, but many times the fruit of their life will demonstrate what's in their heart. He does admit that we should not make excuses for when people miss it because it does taint the word of God. And I would agree with that. We should not make excuses. We need to call a spade a spade. And there are repercussions because of that in the word of God. And again, I would just go to the fact that there is a poor understanding of, of, of prophecy. Number two was very interesting because he said just because he had been accurate in the past it didn't mean that he was going to be accurate in the future. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for laughing because uh, it's sometimes I laugh inappropriately if I if I'm trying to get past a, a difficult situation or um, to not get upset about something. But it just seemed again. I, I just thought, what are you saying? Just because you just talked about how accurate you've been, you talked about this in part one about telling people how accurate you are and how accurate you were for 2016, but yet just because you've been accurate in the past doesn't mean you're going to be accurate in the future. I don't know what you do with that, except say, that's not biblical. Now, number three, I would agree with. He said, we can't blame others for not praying enough. That's true. We'll just leave that one. And then number four, he said, you can't excuse error by blaming fraud. And again, there was a lot of issues surrounding that election. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but, you know, th those two points I would agree with. But again, I don't agree that there's a fallible prophecy today. And he does end with part one, with, again, saying that the charismatic movement is in dire need of reformation and that there's sickness going on and there's major issues. And again, I would agree with that. I think the issues are is that there's been some improper teaching and biblical illiteracy and a heavy reliance on um, outlets such as charisma and the elijah list and others that are pumping out these words like they're pez dispensers and they're the people are relying on these words and what's sad is that some of these people know these words more than they know the very word of god so they know something that may or may not have been divinely inspired by god depending on who you talk to in this movement. But at the same time, they'll say, oh, well, these words, though, are not on par with scripture. They're not authoritative. So we've created, it, it would appear that another God has been created, uh, another facet of God or another God, really, that is not authoritative, even though his word is authoritative. So how could someone not come around, as I've said before, and say, well, there's parts of his word that are authoritative, but these other ones aren't. You see what I'm saying here? It can get very muddy really fast. And this is why there needs to be sound biblical teaching on the on prophecy. Now, part two begins with the mandate that God told Jeremiah to do in the midst of all of this debacle. This has nothing to do with making money. This series has nothing to do with saving face. In fact, if I was doing it for those reasons, I would have never even started this series. But I'm under a mandate from the Lord who said to me that he wanted me to talk publicly through a series about my prophetic process with Donald Trump. And then he wanted me to talk about the needed reformation in the prophetic movement. Now, now as so Jeremiah goes on, he's going to begin to talk about passages such as 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 14, 29, which are a couple of them that are used in the prophetic movement in order to validate that there is fallible prophecy today and why we need to test these things and uh, abstain from the evil and hold on to the good and that two or three prophets are to weigh and they believe, Jeremiah believes that it's to test the word and not the person. You can listen to that right now. And weigh. If the New Testament prophets were infallible, why does Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 and, and 1 Thessalonians 5 make these statements? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. 
If underneath the new covenant, if New Testament prophets were infallible, you have people writing online. Why are you apologizing? If what God really said was true, you shouldn't have to apologize. Again, that very language smacks of an old covenant mindset concerning prophetic ministry. New covenant, New Testament prophetic ministry is actually supposed to be submitted to other prophets and individuals who can weigh in and judge what's been spoken. What about 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Do not treat prophecy with contempt. Test them all. Hold on to that which is good. Folks, if in 1 Thessalonians 5 it says, test all prophecy, then new covenant prophecy is not only uh, infallible, it says to hold on to that which is good, meaning that there is prophecy given that is not good, that should be thrown out, that should be challenged. Again, I want to go on record as saying that I believe parts of the charismatic prophetic movement are deeply sick. I believe that God has issued a divine correction to the charismatic prophetic movement, and what he's targeting is our misunderstanding between the role and authority of Old Testament prophets versus the role and authority of New Testament prophets. In the Old Testament, they were singular voices to the nation. They can come and go as they please. They were speaking as if they were God. Underneath the new covenant, prophets have been placed in family, in community. They should be accountable to other fivefold ministries. They're never given permission to wander around like they did in the Old Covenant. And finally, the prophetic words that new covenant prophets give should be tested and weighed. In other words, if social media just provides an avenue just to print out and publish anything that I think God says without submitting it to other leaders, I'm violating new covenant prophetic prophets principles. Now, when I released my public apology on January 7th, I had said in the letter that before I published that apology, I had submitted it to senior and seasoned leaders in the body of Christ. And what I found shocking and deeply troubling was we received more hate mail and criticism, not because I had inaccurately prophesied that Donald Trump would win a second term. More than that, all of the anger in the vitriol was focused on Jeremiah. You don't need to submit your words to fivefold leaders. You only answer to God. We've had hundreds of people write in and tell me the number one mistake you made during this election cycle is you chose to listen to the voice of others. We have people writing in saying, thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah, you shall not listen to any leader in your life, but be led by the Holy Spirit. Folks, I seriously want to tell you, this is not wise counsel. This is not New Testament Bible-based encouragement. There is a rogue, there is a rebellious spirit in the charismatic prophetic movement that I believe has caused many of the issues that we're facing right now in 2021. Now I want to play for you two clips back to back. This is a discussion that Justin Peters had with Nathan Busnitz. Nathan Busnitz is uh, very knowledgeable about the charismatic movement, about the prophetic in particular, when you've listened to him and in church history. I want you to listen to these two clips where he talks about a new definition being made in the charismatic movement regarding prophecy. And I also want you to listen to his rebuttal in addressing the beliefs regarding such passages as 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Corinthians 14:29. Yeah, I would say that that is an argument that has developed in the last 100 years or 120 years since the birth of Pentecostalism in 1901. And it's developed out of necessity because it's become very clear that the prophet, the prophecy and the prophets that are um, so abundant in the broader charismatic movement that their prophecy does not meet the biblical standard of 100% accuracy. So what do you do when you have a reality that you're claiming to be a prophet but you don't meet the standard of 100% accuracy, you have to invent a category in which you can still claim to be a prophet and yet not meet the biblical standard. And that's exactly what the charismatic movement has done. So you're right, the claim is that in the New Testament, there were the apostles and other writers of the New Testament who were held to the same standard as Old Testament prophets. And so the New Testament meets that standard. But then there's a second class or a second tier of prophet some would call these congregational prophets. Some would just call them New Testament prophets. And the idea is that the congregational prophets, uh, they didn't always get it right. So the standard of infallibility and also the expectation of authority, both of those things are absent from New Testament prophets. So the New Testament prophets, the congregational prophets, this again is the charismatic, um, this is the category that they invented. Uh, it, it is this idea that you have people who they get a revelation from God, but then either because they don't have enough faith or something else happens, that message gets muddled. And so when they speak it, uh, it doesn't come out with 100% accuracy. And it also is not authoritative. So you don't have to obey it. You can if you want. And uh, the prophet's not held liable if they say, for example, God told me that you should go and sell your house. And then you go and sell your house. And that ends up being a really bad thing that you did, financially unwise. Well, the prophet can always say, well, look, maybe I got the prophecy wrong. It wasn't authoritative. It wasn't inerrant. Um, it, it really degrades the idea of prophecy and puts it almost on the level of just 
sort of spiritual advice. In fact, I'll quote from the same article from which I just read a minute ago. Uh, he said of the prophets, maybe you did not intend to mislead. Maybe you are acting in sincerity and integrity, truly believing the Lord had spoken. Uh, maybe you were so grieved over where the radical left was going that you prophesied what you desired. Maybe you sensed God's intent. That's language not found in the Bible, but uh, maybe you sensed God's intent. Maybe you got caught up in the power of the group. So, you know, maybe, 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 maybe this is what happened. Maybe this is why you did what you did. Uh, and he makes the argument that, yes, they were obviously wrong, but they were not intentionally wrong. And a false prophet is one who is intentionally deceiving people. And his argument is that these folks weren't intentionally trying to deceive people. What would be, what would be your response to that? Yeah, my, my response to that would be to say that sincerity is not part of the biblical test for determining the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. There are many in false religions who are sincere in their pursuit of that false religion, but they are sincerely wrong. Mm -hmm. What we're dealing with here is a claim that people are making that they are spokesmen or spokeswomen, spokespeople for God, that they are a mouthpiece for God. And they are claiming to deliver revelatory content from God to his people. The sincerity of that belief is irrelevant. From a biblical standard, from the standpoint of the biblical standard, all that matters is whether or not their claim is true. And you can test whether or not their claim is true based on those criteria that we talked about earlier. Doctrinal orthodoxy, moral integrity, and then to the point of what we're speaking about right now, revelatory accuracy. Mm -hmm. If I claim to be a prophet and I say, this is what God says, and then what comes out of my mouth next is not true, then my claim that I am a spokesman for God is proven to be false. The sincerity of that claim, again, is irrelevant. Right. Sincerity is not the issue. Truth is the issue. So that's 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 to 22. Again, written at a time when everyone agrees the gift of prophecy was active. Why would Paul tell the Thessalonians, do not despise prophetic utterances? It's because the Thessalonians had been burned by false prophets, false prophets who had given them incorrect information about the coming of the day of the Lord. And Paul has to set their eschatology straight. And they're so burned by false prophets and so wary of anyone claiming to be a prophet that Paul has to say, hey, look, if somebody comes to you and they're a genuine prophet, listen to them. And then he gives them this added instruction, examine everything carefully or test everything carefully. How are they supposed to do that? Well, I believe they were supposed to do that in the same way that the Bereans did that in Acts 17.11. In fact, it was right after Paul was in Thessalonica that he went to Berea and then the Bereans investigated, searched the scriptures to see if these things were true. And Luke says that they were noble for doing that. So how do you examine revelatory or prophetic content? How do you examine, if somebody says, I have a message from God for you, how do you know if that's true? You, you uh, test it against what has been revealed in scripture. And, and then Paul goes on to say, uh, cling to that which is good. And, and far too often, that's where the charismatics stop quoting these verses. But the very next phrase is important in verse 22. Paul says, avoid that which is evil, which is to say that if someone claims to have a prophetic word from God, and it is not actually from God, it is in the category of evil that must be avoided. Right. Um, just a couple more comments. The issue in 1 Thessalonians 5 is not one prophet who says some things that are good and some things that are bad, and you're trying to decide which was good and which was bad. It's that you're actually testing the prophet himself to see if the prophet is a true prophet or a false prophet prophet. Uh, that's in keeping with the warnings throughout the New Testament, starting with Jesus in Matthew 7, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing and you will know them by their fruit. So the danger of false prophets was a very real danger. And the Thessalonians are to test what's being said so they can know the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. Uh, so this idea that you're going to just kind of I remember hearing one charismatic author say one time that it's like calling balls and strikes and you just kind of call it as you see it. That is not what 1 Thessalonians 5 is about. It's right. about discerning the difference between true prophets and false prophets, doing so against the standard of scripture and avoiding as evil those who demonstrate themselves to be false prophets. Yeah. And then I would just say real quickly, that's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14, 29. When it says the others are to pass judgment, the word that's used there is the Greek term. It's a form of uh, diakrino, which is a term to pass judgment that almost always refers to passing judgment about people, not about whether or not 
a, a message got some things right and some things wrong, like we're doing some sort of sermon evaluation. It's about actually passing judgment on whether this person is a true prophet or a false prophet. Because again, in the first century, that the church always had to be on guard for those who would seek to creep in unnoticed and wreak havoc by claiming to be prophets when in fact they were not truly God's spokesmen. It is in this part two video that Jeremiah also teaches the people the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophets. Recognize the difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. In the Old Testament, the prophets spoke the very words of God. However, in the New Testament, prophets speak as yielded vessels to the Holy Spirit. They're submitted vessels, and they now submit their words to the body of Christ to judge and weigh. Let me just recap here by giving you four differences between Old Testament and New Testament ministry. Once again, I want to give you four differences between Old Testament and New Testament prophets. Number one, New Testament prophets no longer operate in the same authority as they did in the Old Testament. Number two, New Testament prophets have now been placed in the body of Christ, where they are to develop community and accountability. Number three, the primary focus of New Testament prophets is not predicting future events, but rather revealing Jesus Christ to his body. And number four, the words of New Testament prophets are not infallible, and what they prophesy must be tested and judged. And now I want to play one more clip for you, and it can also be applicable later on when Jeremiah goes in to talk about Deuteronomy 18. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind as well. I want you to listen to what Nathan Buesnitz says about the prophets being a mouthpiece for God concerning Deuteronomy 18 and the, the sobriety and the seriousness of being a prophet for God. Absolutely. There really is nothing more serious than misrepresenting revelation from God, claiming to have revelation from God when it's not from God, distorting what God has truly said, and putting yourself in a position where you claim to be a mouthpiece for God, but in fact, you're just a mouthpiece for your own imagination. I think of Ezekiel chapter 13, where Ezekiel condemns the false prophets and says, you know, you're just hoping, you're making predictions and hoping they come to pass. Uh, that's not biblical prophecy. Prophecy, when it came to the predictive side of prophecy, is saying in the past what will happen in the future because the God who controls the future has given you that revelatory content. And again, Deuteronomy 18, if you make a prediction and the prediction doesn't come true, You've just shown, you've exposed yourself to the whole world that you are not what you have claimed to be. Uh, another passage that comes to mind is Jeremiah 23, where Jeremiah similarly denounces the false prophets as those who simply proclaim their own imagination. Yeah. And if it doesn't come from God, it comes from some other source. And Ezekiel 13 and Jeremiah 23 uh, place that in the simple, arrogant imaginations of uh, those who would be so presumptuous as to claim to speak for God when in fact they do not. At the end of this video in part two, Jeremiah concludes with saying that there is false unity in the charismatic movement. And he says that God led him to Genesis 11, which is the account of the Tower of Babel. And in the middle of all this, he begins to prophetically say over them or to uh, declare over them about how there's confusion within that camp and that he believes that God is bringing the charismatic movement through his error and through what's going on into an Acts 2 moment, into the true move of God, into the greatest revival, the, co the next coming great revival that is on the horizon. But in part three, he begins to teach the people about the difference between a true prophet of God and a false prophet. On tonight's episode, I want to talk about the difference between false prophets and true prophets. This is certainly an area of confusion right now in the body of Christ that I believe the Bible has much to say. What we're hearing feedback on and what we're watching around the internet world is people challenging, why would a prophet say sorry? People are saying a prophet is never wrong. If they're actually hearing from God, they don't need community. They don't need accountability. And tonight, I want to show you biblically why much of that rhetoric is inaccurate, why a prophet could actually miss a prophecy and still be accurate on other prophecies and more than that, what if the greatest measure of a New Testament prophet wasn't their accuracy? What if it actually had to do with their morality or even their doctrine? Let's begin tonight by talking about some earmarks of true prophets. He says there are three traits to a New Testament prophet. The first is they are to direct those to Jesus Christ. The second is they are to correct. And the third is they are to predict. Though he says that predict is the least used of all of those or should be the least used of all of those. He also goes on to tell them what his understanding is of a false prophet. This is according to Jeremiah Johnson. Perhaps in the New Testament, more of an accurate sign that someone is a false prophet is not that they miss a prophecy, but that they miss a prophecy and refuse to repent for missing the prophecy. Now, let's talk about false prophets. Many people uh, immediately want to bring up the passage in Deuteronomy where it says this. 
Any prophet who presumes to speak in my name or a prophet who prophesies in the names of other gods is a false prophet and they should be put to death. A lot of folks hear about a prophet who gives a word of prophecy and it doesn't come to pass. They automatically say they're a false prophet. If they were in the Old Testament, they would be stoned. But if we look at this passage in Deuteronomy, it specifically says this. If any prophet presumes to speak in my name, this Hebrew word presumes has to do with intention, intentionality. In other words, a willful act. This passage in Deuteronomy is saying a prophet who willfully and intentionally leads people away from God should be put to death. This has nothing to do with an individual who gives a prediction about the future and misses it. This doesn't have to do with them. This has to do with individuals in the Old Testament who willingly and intentionally led people away from God. In the Old Covenant, God says they should be put to death. So when we talk about false prophets, we have to get away. We have to move away from this understanding that false prophets are people who inaccurately predict the future. I want to actually come to you tonight and tell you that false prophets are going to hell. False prophets intentionally lead the body of Christ astray. False prophets are individuals who they fail a moral test, they fail a doctrine test, and many of them can even fail an accuracy test. And I'll just remind you again of what Nathan Busnett said in Deuteronomy 18. If you want to go back a few minutes, you can listen to that. But I think his response is, is very helpful in understanding the interpretation of Deuteronomy 18, that it's not about intentionality and it's not about sincerity either, as he mentioned earlier in one of the other clips, that sincerity is not, again, the, the standard by which we go. But th this passage is not talking about the intention. Um, in fact, I want to read this to you from even the Moody commentary. When we look in the Moody commentary, this is what it has to say, for instance, to kind of give us a better understanding of what presumptuously means here. They say this is important textually in that the nation was not to rely on divination of any sort. The nation was to execute any prophet who spoke presumptuously what the Lord had not revealed to him or who spoke in the name of other gods. To speak presumptuously was to speak without authorization or to claim rights that are not legitimately possessed. In this passage, it refers to a false prophet who espouses an attitude or behavior that rejects God's authority. To determine whether a prophet spoke in the name of the Lord, people were to see if the prophet's words came true. If they did not, then that prophet had spoken presumptuously and the people were not to be afraid of what he had predicted. So another helpful resource to help us understand the importance of proper interpretation of a passage of scripture and not just reading into it of saying, well, it had to do with someone's intentions, the intentions of their heart. And that's what makes a false prophet. It's not even about accuracy. And I was dumbfounded, honestly, when he even talked about this in the videos of saying, well, what if a false prophet is not known by their accuracy, but it's about their morality and things, which, you know, Nathan Busens has talked about this, the three standards um, for a prophet. And I, like I said, I'll put the link below in the description at the timestamp for when they talked because it was very helpful. But he talks about that, that there are three standards that, he, that when he's done study on this that appear to align with what scripture says as far as their orthodoxy, their orthopraxy, their accuracy. And um, morality certainly falls in with that, but accuracy is just as important. Um, and again, the irony, the irony of saying, oh, well, I've had thousands of accurate prophecies, but, you know, just because I got, got everything right in the past doesn't mean I'm going to get it right in the future. So that means I'm not a false prophet because I missed it this time. I missed it. I missed it. So, um, yeah, it doesn't make me a false. Yes, it does. It does. And, and for lack of, again, beating the dead prophetic horse here. One false prophecy is one too many. Repent, repent. And that doesn't mean just say you're sorry. It means don't return to this stuff. Don't go back to it. Don't keep doing this. That's not repentance. <laughs> I'm sorry to break it off. It's not repentance. When you return back to what you said you were once doing that was an error and sin against God, that is not repentance. There is a difference that scripture talks about between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. So one has to ask the question, uh, was there godly sorrow here? Or was there worldly sorrow because of being so public and being so exposed? Um, and, you know, I, these are questions. These are all questions that need to be asked personally. And we need to be asking this when people are claiming to hear God for themselves and to speak on his behalf. He then goes on to talk about that there is true prophecy, even if you miss it.
test. But I want to be very clear. Just because an individual inaccurately prophesies a future event does not mean they're a false prophet. A prophet in the New Testament can inaccurately prophesy a future event. If this happens, they should repent. They should humble themselves. But this doesn't mean that they can't ever accurately prophesy a future uh, event again. They just need to come back and find out where they went wrong. And he outlines, and there's a screenshot that I'll share right here, of what identifies one as a false prophet. He then ends the video with wanting to give five pieces of prophetic advice. The first one is to seek feedback and counsel. Number two was to develop a solid track record with accuracy, humility, and being teachable. Number three was to earn the privilege to prophesy publicly and to have Christ-likeness. Number four, to be sensitive to personal manipulation and control with the words you release. And the last one was that the outcome should not be a liability but an asset. So take those for what you will, but that's the prophetic advice that he wanted to give. Now we're getting close to the end, but this is an important part I want to um, address. During this whole time, um, right after the January letters and then the February I was wrong series, it was not long after this, at the beginning of March, that Jeremiah made the announcement that he was shutting down Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. And you can see in some of these news articles um, that I have taken screenshots of. Now, you can see in here that they talk about, uh, for instance, Christianity Today. Regardless of what you think about these news media outlets, these are, I'm just sharing these for information's sake. The ChristianityToday.com, they shared it on their social media and they shared it uh, on, online on their website. So March 8th of 2021, um, Jeremiah Johnson Ministries, you'll see here, it, it's, it's highlighted in blue. This is off their Facebook page. It says, we'll shut down after the prophet apologized for incorrectly predicting a Donald Trump re-election victory. And you'll see that his, his name is highlighted, Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. And he's saying that he's going to shut it down. And when I actually clicked on that, I would have expected that I would have come to a page where it said, oh, this page no longer exists, you know, as, as we've seen before in Facebook pages when we've tried to find things. Um, for example, uh, when I show you this particular post where the picture is blank, but it still leaves a link to where you can look at this uh, online, that that no longer exists. So uh, jeremiahjohnson.tv still exists. It was never shut down. But that's still there, but this is not there. And so some of these things have disappeared. But then when you try to find his Facebook Live where he talked about he was shutting everything down, that is gone because of the, I, I, I think it may have been on his personal page. I, I don't know. But I'm, again, I'm just presenting to you what's, what's on here. So um, but this article, when it talks about that, he, he is saying that he faced the backlash and that he's ending Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. The announcement comes after much prayer and clear direction of the Lord. And, and then it talks about his series that he did, and it goes on in some of these articles. But I want you to notice here, when you click on this page, this is what pops up. It's Jeremiah Johnson. And when you go to look at the details for this Facebook page, again, I'm just presenting to you the, the, the stuff that's online. So you can go look for yourself for this. But when you go on Facebook, and you look at this, you're going to notice a couple of things. You're going to notice this is not a new account. You're going to notice 329,000 followers, 156,000 likes. You're also going to notice that I pulled up the history of it with the name change. And it, the account was created January 13th of 2015. So this is not a new account. So it was not shut down. And the name was changed several times. In 2017, it was changed to Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. Uh, in March of 2023, it was changed to Jeremiah Johnson. So we can see here the page transparency. This is not a new account and it's linking to these old articles that are saying that he shut down uh, everything on social media. There was another thing another YouTuber had done I came across, uh, Sean Christie from Revealing Truth. He had talked about um, a few years ago with this about the shutting down of the ministry. He pulled this up on YouTube. Now you cannot find this YouTube channel on there any longer. You do find Jeremiah Johnson. And I wanna show you a few things on that. Again, you take this as you will and judge it based on what I'm showing you. But this was at the time a few years ago on Sean Christie's channel, the Alter Global. And you can see the description of it here. And it says it was, uh, he, they joined June 18th of 2015. 
what I found very interesting when I went to go look at some of these things online was I found his his YouTube channel is called Jeremiah Johnson. It has 103, 104,000 subscribers now. And it was created in June of 2015. There's a day discrepancy and I don't know why that is. I'm thinking that there was a name change, but I can't find an easy way to, to uh, look at the history like you can on Facebook to see if there was a name change. But when you look, for example, at this screenshot, the same order that um, Sean showed on his video of the, of the, um, the different videos available it's the exact same order and even the jesus christ is coming soon for example has the same a number of plays on it ten thousand in three years some of them are not as much as uh, changed in a few years so my question is is this the same channel and he just changed the name of it um and and, and there's one video of the ultra global that's missing off that one when you look at the playlist compared to what sean had in his screenshot on his video so that was an interesting thing. He does have a new uh, Instagram account, but you can see uh, again uh, on the Alter Global, February 7th of 2022, there is a post that said one year ago, we had over 300,000 followers on our ministry Facebook page, Jeremiah Johnson Ministries and another 100,000 that followed anything I or our staff posted, whether true or false, that's, this is a weird statement. Anything I or our staff posted, whether true or false, real or fake would get thousands of shares. And like most days, every prophetic dream or insight on current and political event, I receive would be picked up instantly by popular magazines, websites, and yeah. So, but but then he's chastising the people about their actions towards all this. He's saying uh, he said it was truly stunning just how fast people you had never met would believe anything you said or sold. It's really uh, just disheartening again to see some of this. But as we go on, it's going to get more disheartening if this is the, indeed the case. So he goes on in this Facebook post to say, on March 15th, 2021, I had our team pull the plug after a decade of large online influence. God clearly spoke to me that it was time to flush it all down the toilet and begin with a death beyond what I could have ever imagined. It was honestly one of the most difficult decisions of my life. Our staff totally deleted the Jeremiah Johnson Ministries page and my personal Facebook page. And he goes on to say, a famous leader told me in agony, you are committing influencer suicide in front of a generation who has no real grasp of what you are truly forfeiting in terms of reach, finances, and publicity. And he goes on to say that and ends it with fresh tears. But again, did he shut it down or did he change the name of it? Because I just showed you where there's a page he has that was created in 2015 and it's it changed names from Jeremiah Johnson Ministries to Jeremiah Johnson. That I, That's a question. If you're going to claim on there and claim that you gave up all of this and you shut everything down because God's clear because God clearly spoke to you that it was time to flush it all down the toilet and that you had a death and that this death was what brought about the new ministry the altar global and then there's the whole question of was the altar global a, around before all this because when Sean when looked at this online a few years ago on YouTube it said the altar global had joined YouTube in 2015 again I don't know if there had been a few name changes on that YouTube channel because you can change names on that YouTube channel, on your on your YouTube channels, because you can change your name on a YouTube channel. But what I'm, th this is just because to me, this is an integrity issue. This is an integrity and it's, it's establishing a false narrative that of martyrdom and that God is elevating you in your false prophecy to another level and I just find it really troubling to present something like that. So you look at the evidence. So I wanna play one more thing for you. On March 21st of 2023, Jeremiah Johnson went again on Strang Report on Steve Strang's podcast, and he uh, answered some questions for him. The title of that episode was called Jeremiah Johnson Speaks Out on Why He Shut Down Jeremiah Johnson Ministries. Please have a listen to some of the things that were said on that episode. Been uh, recently, and I want to just thank you for this opportunity. You know, it was uh, several weeks ago, uh, about four to be exact, where I really felt God be really specific with me that He was asking me to uh, terminate, to shut down 
Jeremiah Johnson Ministries, uh, which I have been uh, really serving a particular mission for a little over a decade. And if I could uh, kind of frame what that uh, mission or the mandate was, I, I was providing prophetic commentary on various political and current events. And there were many dreams and visions uh, that I would have that I would minister on really a variety of subjects in the kingdom of God. And after the election and uh, just so so much uh, news and uh, what I viewed as a mistake that I made, I really felt God leading me to shut down the ministry. And what he had asked me to do was to really focus, uh, to give a sole focus on what he began to speak to me about was called the altar global, where he wanted me to focus on his return and the preparation of the bride unto that reality. And there were a lot of news sources and stations that that picked uh, this story up and has been a lot of reactions. But Steve, on my end, um, there's there's been a great price, a great loss in some ways of shutting down Jeremiah Johnson Ministries, but I, I really uh, consider it the kindness of God, His intervention in leading me uh, to this uh, new reality uh, that that I'm now running with. Well, I want to drill down a little bit, but um, you know, I can understand a little bit of what you're going through. The circumstances were entirely different, but you know, for basically 30 years, my organization was called Strength Communications, and we did not shut it down. But we did change names. We rebranded as Charisma Media. And uh, I just felt that I should take my name off the company for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I can kind of understand this, although I know you well enough to know that this is not literally a rebranding. You just felt like the Lord was taking you in a different um, direction. And so I believe personally, God rescued me out of a, 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 a large uh, swirl or a, a large movement that I was a part of and asked me to bow out, to shut down my ministry and to start all over again. And I'm thankful for it. It was super painful. It's a lesson and lessons that I'll take with me as a young man moving forward. But I just, I see the hand of God in it on my end uh, moving forward. But I do very much believe that God is still trying to rescue people out of an obsession uh, with the next latest, greatest prophetic word and what's happening and really wants to mark a generation for eternity. Now, I want you to listen again to what he said, because he is reiterating again that he is shutting everything down, shutting down Jeremiah Johnson Ministries and that uh, all the social media he's mentioned on the uh, the articles that mentioned that the newspaper articles. Um, John Elving had noted that that you that video you can't see any longer, but he had noted that in a past video that Sean Christie had noted about that all the social media was going away, that it was just going to all flush it down. And it, it would appear that the Facebook page, the ministry page was not shut down. There are still over 300 some odd thousand uh, followers. It was created in 2015. But then there was one other thing that I came across when I was doing some research. So I looked into the Alter Global Incorporated. That's what it's listed as uh, legally. And it's listed as a nonprofit. And I'm going to show this screenshot and some of the things I found. And again, you can take it for what you will. And some people may say, well, how dare you bring up something like this? Can't you just leave this alone? But here's a screenshot of what I found. And so I uh, was looking some things up and it's in North Carolina because they moved. That's another thing too, is that he started a ministry in Florida that he was a minister over for, I think, 10 years, I think. And then they, they said that God led them in 2020 to move to North Carolina and to start, start this ministry. So they started the Altar Global. And uh, we can see here that um, there was a previous name listed, Jeremiah Johnson Ministries Incorporated. Now, I don't know if his ministry was incorporated prior to all of all the everything else that happened. It doesn't look like it was. It looks like that. What he did was the only thing I can gather from this, and the source of this you can see at the bottom, is North Carolina Secretary of State Business Registration Division. And this was updated as February 24th of 2024. So it shows a recent filing for the Alter Global. Um, in October 8, 28th of 2020, there was an article of corporation. And when you look at that and just click on it, it shows you as a creation filing. But then when you go and you continue to look at this, 
you go and see the next thing in the list was the corporation name change. And the corporation name change happened March 1st of 2021. Well, it gives the appearance on here when you look at it, previous name, Jeremiah Johnson Ministries Incorporated. There's now a corporate name change to the Alter Global. Then there was a filing date for designation statement of change of principal, a principal office and registered agent name, and then change of address. This uh, that happened in June of 2021, and then the change of address in July of 2022. So these things happen, and th and this just just looking at this again, I'm thinking you said repeatedly, the Arctic News article said repeatedly, you shut down your ministry, all of this loss you had. These people that you said that you once gave a platform to and that they turned against you and all these things happened to you. And now you're saying that God said that a death had to occur, a death in his ministry had to occur in order for something to be birthed. And then saying that you shut everything down. But then when you look at this, it, it calls things into question. Was, was everything really shut down or was this a rebranding? Is this true biblical repentance? I, I think taking everything in consideration, um, I think the, the lesson that we need to learn from something like this is, um, and the questions we need to ask, and to those loved ones and family members that would rely on people today saying that they're a prophet of God and that they need to hear what they're saying and they need their dreams and revelations and their visions um, in order to, to, to know what God is doing and to know God himself and not relying on the very written word of God. And I understand that people can make errors and they may make, um, mistakes along the way. No, I'm not talking about false prophecy. I'm talking that they may not convey certain things properly, or they may not have all the details, or they may get the details out of order, and it's an honest mistake. But when you have repetitive things that are said of, I shut everything down, I shut everything down, I shut everything down, I gave all this away, This I sacrificed all this, and God birthed this new ministry, uh, preparing people for the return of Jesus Christ, but then you're still prophesying about big events and, and things going on in the news and in the charismatic movement. And um, it's just, the question is, is this true biblical repentance? I want to share an article with you off a website called Core Christianity, and the pastor is Adriel Sanchez. He does a radio show too called Core Christianity, and he answers this in this article called What's the Difference Between True and False Repentance? And I think it's a good read. I think it's very helpful. So I would encourage you to read through it. Um, and he talks about that, that true repentance does not regret parting ways with sin. False repentance does. True repentance hates sin. False repentance hates the consequences of sin. True repentance accepts godly counsel and accountability. False repentance avoids accountability. And so I think that that's worth reading. And um, it's also worth considering in scripture where we see biblical repentance. Uh, we can look in Luke 18 and we can see the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector and see um, the contrition and the brokenness and, and someone not saying, well, look at all these things that I did and, and look how much I do and how much I give and how much I sacrificed. But we see the tax collector saying, beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, recognizing the need for Christ, the cleansing that Christ can only bring through um, his death, his burial, his resurrection, through believing in the power of the gospel, the salvation um, that his gospel brings, and focusing on our need for him and the fact of repenting means not just a turning away, but that every, that your, their, your desires change. There's a transformation that God brings to you when repentance comes. There's a brokenness that comes with that because you know that you've sinned against God and you recognize the, the ugliness and the evil and the wickedness of that sin and how it separates you from God. But you are thankful for his grace and his mercy that he's cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And that can only happen through the power of the gospel through us repenting and believing, turning from our sins and turning to Christ. 
turning away and no longer loving the things that we once loved, no longer seeking the things that we once sought, but seeking God's ways and what his word says. And we can even see in the Old Testament that David repented, for example, in his, in his ways of his horrible sin, of his sexual immorality with Bathsheba, of covering up the pregnancy, of having her husband killed in order to cover up that sin. And Nathan exposed that by the power of God. And it brought David to repentance, and he still paid a tremendous price for that. He lost his son through that. But God was still merciful to, to him, and David recognized he was sinning against God himself. He even laments about that in, in that account and in the Psalms. He sinned against God. And another thought, just a, a small one to point out, but he talked about the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophets. Um, I think Busnitz did a, a great job helping us to see that there is no difference as far as the standard for prophets between the Old Testament and New Testament. But Jeremiah made a point of saying, um, you know, the Old Testament prophets, they were the mouthpiece for God, but in the New Testament, they yield to the Holy Spirit and uh, their, their words are judged. Well, it, there doesn't seem to be any different. What you're saying is not any different because the Old Testament prophets, I mean, even when we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, um, Beginning in verse 10, concerning this salvation, which is the gospel, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And this is a major problem in the prophetic movement, that this belief of, yeah, you can miss it. It's okay. You're just practicing hearing the voice of God. Again, I taught that, and I once believed that. That's error. That's not lining up with, with Scripture and what it says. We can see in 1 Peter chapter 1, and go read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. It shows that the Old Testament prophets were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and he was the one that inspired them to write the more sure word of prophecy. There's no need for this stuff today. And if it's an error or we can say that it's false, then how does that glorify God? It doesn't. It doesn't glorify God. In fact, I would argue as someone who had things that did not come to pass. I had things that came to pass and I had things that did not come to pass. We go by what scripture says. We go by the standard and the standard is 100% accuracy because anything less than that brings reproach on the name of Christ. So having taken everything into consideration that uh, has been shared today, um, I know that it can be fueled with a lot of emotion. Uh, and some some questions and some people may not even like the fact of of questioning these things and, and even um, questioning Jeremiah and others. But uh, I'm concerned and I know others are concerned. I would agree on a couple of things that Jeremiah said. And one of the biggest ones is, is that I think that there is um, a huge problem in the charismatic movement. It's a huge problem, and it even it goes a step beyond um, Id idolizing prophetic words, and that goes on. Uh, there's people that know these words better than they know the scripture, and that's that's really problematic. Um, but the claim that prophecy can be fallible and that's okay, it's it's just okay but not okay so it's kind of a mixed bag of emotion with that or mixed teaching with that and to be so flippant with it really there doesn't seem to be a lot of brokenness and contrition um over sinning against god himself using his name in vain of saying things he didn't say and stamping his name to them i think there's a major problem when you have people that don't see the severe the severity of 
falsely prophesying. And then making allowances, creating doctrines that allow for error in prophecy. And I, I just have to say that I'm thankful to be out of that. I'm thankful to be out of that. And I'm thankful to a merciful and holy God that granted me repentance um, from doing that in this movement. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that um, the gospel just doesn't seem to be enough. And, and even when the gospel's presented, it's, it's, it's twisted. Um, it's not even the good news of the death, burial, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's, it's more works-based than anything. When, when Not everybody in this movement, and I don't want to lump all charismatics, as I've said, into the NAR, and, and I recognize that. But I will say in this movement, and, I, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this, Jeremiah is part of the New Apostolic Reformation. I've heard even him prophesying a while back and, and citing C. Peter Wagner that the vision that he peered into was going to come to pass. Um, and he acknowledges um, multiple things that are within the New Apostolic Reformation and um, affirms modern-day apostles and prophets with governing authority. And um, there, there's a lot going on here, um, the Seven Mountain Mandate and, and other things that are going on. There's, there's just so much that's, that's problematic. We need to get back to Scripture. We need to get back to what biblical repentance is and what it and what false repentance is. We need to recognize true repentance. This has been a um, much more difficult video to tackle. Get back to scripture. Go back, go back to the word of God. Go back to the more sure word of prophecy. Uh, that's, that, that's what I would tell you. Go back to the more sure word of prophecy because it's all you need. Because you don't need fallible prophecy and you don't need these modern day prophets today that um, are going to, to tell you about their accuracy, but then when they're not accurate, they're going to tell you, oh, I messed it, I messed, I'm, I'm, I messed up, but that doesn't make me a false prophet. And they're going to deny the standard set in Scripture that has not changed from the Old Testament. What's changed is that God has been gracious and that those people are not um, under the penalty of physical death. But it's far worse than that. And, and Scripture warns us about false prophets and false teachers, and they're on the same level, mind you. I mean, even in Second Peter, when he talks about them, and he says in, you know, in the past when false prophets came in, just as false prophets came in, false teachers, Second Peter 2, the false teachers will come in uh, with destructive heresies, and, and they deny the master who, the very master who bought them. Um, false prophets and false teachers are equally destructive and equally a concern. And it's, it's, it's a sobering concern. And it's not one to take lightly. And we need not be afraid to go back to what the Word of God says to know what the standard for, for prophecy is. And to rest in the final prophet who has, he is the one now, Hebrews 1, that, that is spoken in the last days, and that's Jesus Christ. And to say that, and that's not denying the Holy Spirit is active today, because he very much is. And one thing he's not doing is he's not endorsing fallible prophecy. So with that, I'm going to end today. I hope, I truly hope that you found this helpful and insightful. And I look forward to being on with you again uh, for the next topic. But until that time comes, be blessed today by the truth of God's Word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.